My name is Michael Manz from Hepatology in Hanover, Germany. It's my pleasure to have with me Gideon Hirschfeld from uh, uh, Birmingham, UK. And we have the pleasure to discuss with you selected abstracts and presentations, posters as well as oral presentations covering autoimmune liver diseases, autoimmune hepatitis, also cholestatic liver diseases like primary biliary cholangitis, PBC, primary sclerosing cholangitis, PSC, and an upcoming disease, which is secondary sclerosing cholangitis in the critically ill patient. We start with autoimmune hepatitis, and uh, there has been one presentation looking at triggers and genetic predisposition. Uh, the first author, Richard Taubert from Hanover Medical School, together with the pediatric department, they looked at more than 200 patients, adult and pediatric, at time of diagnosis, and looked for risk factors and genetic predisposition. And they have confirmed previous results that the genetic background identifies the young population having an increase in association with HLA DRB1 or 3 or 1, while the adult population has a genetic background associated with HLA B1 or 4 or 1. What is also interesting, they screen for various infectious agents. And while the parvovirus was significantly increased in the uh, pediatric population, uh, other viruses, uh, including hepatitis E virus, uh, were markers in the adult population. However, the big challenge in autoimmune hepatitis is treatment. We have very effective treatment since decades, steroids alone or in combination with azathioprine, but we run in problems if this therapy fails. And there are some reports at this meeting which are of interest. And one is from the Netherlands, from uh, Floris van den Brandt, uh, senior authors Gerd Boomer from here in Amsterdam. We are here at the ESL 2017 in Amsterdam. And they evaluated six theoguanine therapy in failure patients for autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, it's a limited number of patients. Uh, uh, some of them respond, but there is nodular regenerative hyperplasia as a significant side effect, while um, the authors state that it's rather safe because 6TG, in particular inflammatory bowel disease, has been used in the Netherlands more than 3,000 patients. However, there are safety issues that uh, suggest that it may not be the ideal second or third line therapy. Gideon, yeah. do you have an opinion on that? I, I think it's interesting. I think there is, there's definitely a need to when we treat our patients with autoimmune hepatitis, optimize what we do already. And so I do work hard on optimizing patients in azathioprine and mercaptopurin. I'll, I'll be honest in saying I, I think that the toxicity issues with this approach really would concern me. And I think the potential for nodular regenerative hyperplasia would be probably something that means that this therapy is not going to be the one that I'm going to choose. I'd also say that in that small group of patients that I have who struggle to get good remission with autoimmune hepatitis, with prednisone and, and azathioprine and mercaptopurin, I, th I think we're into the territory of um, use of biologics, which, are, which is off-label. And clearly, there are differences in opinions about which biologic one could use. Uh, I would say that I, I favor a rituximab approach, but I think there is data at this meeting um, from um, Ansgar Loza's group around anti-TNF. Although one has to be concerned about the, the side effect profile of both, but in particular, we know that anti-TNF therapy has been associated with liver injury. So I'm, I'm not sure whether that matches your practice, but certainly I think the 6TG, that, that's unlikely to be where it's going to head. And I think what we're looking to see is biological approaches to autoimmune hepatitis and, and normal tests. Yeah. I agree with you, and I think we should encourage the pharmaceutical industry to invest in these patients. The problem is autoimmune hepatitis by itself is a rare disease, and the failures to standard yeah. of care are even rarer. And therefore, we need to have international collaborative efforts. And as the first abstract you showed, really the other thing is I think it's many diseases. Yeah. So it, it, there may be a group of patients with autoimmune hepatitis, which is really a steroid response virus, and we don't know which virus it is, or it was a viral trigger. And I, I think it's very interesting that that first um, abstract that you, you highlighted looks at viral triggers. Because I think we already know in clinical practice there is often a trigger. It may be an infection. Sometimes it's a drug. But then it behaves like a standard steroid-responsive 
autoimmune hepatitis. Yeah. So that I think that's what's held back autoimmune hepatitis is it's that little bit more complicated than right. PVC and PSE right. because the heterogeneity in the clinic yeah. is a real challenge. And, and really, again, that speaks to the importance of international studies where we all agree definitions. And so if we are going to all, say, do a study, look at rituximab in, in autoimmune hepatitis, we need to agree why they started the rituximab. Was it bad disease or was it treatment adherence or was it treatment intolerance? Because, of course, an ALT doesn't tell you that. It simply tells you right. that, it, that, that it's a, a difficult patient. But we do know from your own work that you published in gastro, you can do clinical trials in autoimmune hepatitis. Yeah. You just have to be determined. I, I completely agree. Uh, you mentioned rituximab. Uh, it's interesting. It's an anti-B cell antibody. Um, it's rather expensive. We are reluctant in liver diseases for a long time to yep. use expensive drugs. Our nephrology colleagues have no hesitation to give tons of rituximab yes. to all their patients with glomerular nephritis to be a little bit provocative. Yep. Uh, did you see any safety issues in your patients? We haven't seen any new safety signals. I think any, any, any drug, rituximab, anti-TNF, you know, you're entering into that area of atypical infections, uh, risk of malignancy, but we haven't. And you're absolutely right. We're in the slow stream in autoimmune hepatitis because our rheumatologists and our nephrologists and our hematologists have no qualms about using this drug yeah. because they can get reimbursement. Yeah. And they use it, they use it effectively, and we use it effectively as well when we manage to access it. I would just say that with biosimilars coming, I think the cost issue may not be as um, relevant to the future. And of course, we're fooling ourselves as ever about cost, aren't we? Right. Because the short term of a few infusions of rituximab or, or the like is nothing compared to liver transplantation or the consequences of non-adherence. Mm. And again, that's another thing that the autoimmune hepatitis community needs to do is really measure what's happening to the real patients. The patients who don't tolerate their therapies, who have the side effects, who don't go to work because they're not well. And actually, those are all the hidden costs, which would make a drug like, a uh, biologic like rituximab, really not very significant. And as you say, in, in rheumatology, in nephrology, they look at us like, we're, well, what are we doing? I have two questions in this context. The one is rituximab is a uh, antibody. It's a humanized antibody. Could you think of having small molecules that could block the CDA uh, receptor and therefore could be uh, less toxic, yes. could be less expensive, more reproducible. Absolutely, and, and the real reason we don't haven't gone down that path in autoimmune hepatitis is more about trying to demonstrate a need and demonstrate an opportunity yeah. for industry. Because for a disease that is so exquisitely steroid responsive, yeah. it seems nearly implausible okay. that the that these these what these small molecule inhibitors, oral or subcut, are, are, are not going to work. Very it good. doesn't make sense. I have a very additional question. The other approach is. It would be good if we could identify the patients that are responsive to these therapies. And here the Hamburg group has tried to look for the expression of TNF. And they've shown that their patients responding to TNF, that they had an expression of TNF in the lymphocytes, peripheral blood, and in the liver. And there have been data before looking in inflammatory bowel disease mm -hmm. and showing <coughs> that patients responsive to infliximab to TNF antibodies are those who express uh, significantly TNF in the tissue, in the gut. Uh, could you think that we look uh, as well as... Uh, Absolutely. I, I agree with you totally. You know, we need to move into this world of um, response-directed therapy. We see it in hepatitis C. We need to see who, you know, who responds and, and why. And actually, we're already moving into that field. And I was really excited to see that there were two abstracts at this meeting in, in 2017 that looked at acute severe autoimmune hepatitis, a real challenge for our clinicians around the world who can I treat? Who shouldn't I treat? Who should go for transplantation? And a, a very important network study from France where they've got a fantastic rare disease liver network. I think there's another study that you saw from, from Spain. Barcelona, yeah. from Barcelona. Yeah. And really just homing in on this concept that you have this population of acute liver disease. Um, as we all know, you don't know it's autoimmune hepatitis. It's always a very difficult one. What's the trigger? Not all the results are back. Well, what do you do? Yeah. Are you, do you do nothing? Do you transplant? Do you give steroids? Yes, the, in the study I selected from the hospital clinic, first was Maria Carlotta Londono, and uh, she reported a small series of 26 patients. They gave steroids. These were acute, severe, and fulminant autoimmune hepatitis cases. And the bottom line is that a significant number of patients respond. Others do not respond. Uh, those who do not respond, they go on to transplantation. 
and they have a significant number of infections as complications, as you would suggest. But what is also interesting, they try to find out predictive parameters. And here we have some uh, parallelism with acute alcoholic hepatitis. In these patients, we need to know rather early whether they can be saved or not. And the message is that the, the delta in the MELT score after 48 and 72 hours was the best predictor uh, who is responding to steroids or not. Uh, how was it in your study? Yeah, absolutely, and, and that's really interesting because, of course, if you go back to some of the work from Mike Heenan and Kings, they also published in the Journal of Hepatology along this line about looking for change. And in, in the French study, they're looking at exactly the same concept. They're looking at day naught and day seven. And they're also finding that the change in INR, in MELD, is very, very predictive. Now, whether it's predictive enough, whether or not it is um, something you can use for all the patients in front of you, I don't know yet. Yeah. But I do think, again, it changes this paradigm, which I think we have to change for everyone with, with autoimmune cholestatic liver disease, that this is real disease, proactive, and it, we need to be not, we not, mustn't be passive, we must be active. Yeah. So in the setting, do they respond? If they don't respond, you move on to something else. If yes. they do, you're a, you're a winner and you keep going. One practical short question. Can we accept seven days in the transplant setting or do we need to know earlier whether they respond? Very interesting. I mean, that really does depend on where you are and, and where your patient is in the transplant centre or whether they're in a, in a referring centre. Um, I think in practice seven days is probably reasonable because in the real world I think when I transplant, you know, there's a lot of other information I'd like to know. There's a lot of things I'd like to know about disease severity, comorbidity, suitability for transplant. And of course one of the problems with all these studies is what is the definition of severe. So in the, in the French study, severe includes an INR, anything above 1.5. Now that to me is at the, how should I say, at the lower end of severity. You know, an INR of 1.5 to a transplant physician is not really causing them too much concern. So there is this challenge that in both the studies there's quite a still a spectrum of what is acute severe autoimmune hepatitis. So personally I can see that seven days makes a little bit more practical sense. And I think we would need much bigger studies to get down to the point of doing 48 hours to 72 okay. hours. But it speaks to the importance of networks and it speaks to the importance of these patients being managed in conjunction with the teams who can do um, both medical treatment and surgical treatment. Okay. Now, now we switch to primary biliary cholangitis, as it's called now, PBC. And uh, this is a disease which received attention because we have new therapies. We use ursus oxycholic acids for, for many, many years now. Uh, we are convinced that it is uh, preventing transplantation in a significant number of patients, but we also agree that we have responders and non-responders. Uh, if you respond, you have an almost normal life expectancy. Uh, you, if you do not respond, and there are criteria, for example, after one year, then you have to face potentially transplantation. Uh, there's a very interesting study from uh, this large international uh, cohort of patients Bettina Hansen is heading this uh, from Rotterdam. And the first author is Carla Murillo Perez. They looked at more than 5,000 PBC patients and looked how the disease changed over time. And uh, the bottom line is that uh, we see an increase in age at time of diagnosis. We see an increase in milder forms of PBC and an increase in the proportion of males. While the proportion of males increasing, I think, is a true change in the uh, um, cohorts of patients with PBC. But Gideon, is the question whether increase in age is real? Do you think so? Um, good question. I mean, I, I would just echo what you said. What an exciting time in PBC. You know, at this meeting, we've launched the new easel guidelines on PBC new licensed therapies and late breakers of add-on therapy. So really lots going on. And as people are focusing more and more attention, we are having to challenge some of the things that we've assumed to be correct. So um, is there more PBC? Well, I suspect there's definitely more awareness and I think there is more diagnosis. And I think in any situation, when you start studying a rare disease, what you discover is, and I think we can see it in PSC, I think we've seen some beautiful literature around you know, how much PSC is in the IBD community that we didn't know, you start to pick up a disease that you hadn't realized was there. And that may well be the explanation for identifying patients with mild disease who are, who are older, who may not previously have come to, to medical attention in, in the same ways. Um, so I think that the epidemiological studies are important and will help us map um, what's happening to, to, to PBC. 
And we mustn't assume, just like we talked about autoimmune hepatitis, that PBC is one disease. Right. We mustn't assume that every patient's the same. So you know, this change in male to female ratio, that's very interesting. I don't think it's a, a huge shift. I think it's still a female predominant disease. But did you know, for example, that proportionately more men are being transplanted. Uh, uh, the ratio of male to female in terms of transplant for PPC is, is skewed because men don't respond to ERSA as much. That's you know, and then we had fantastic, that, that makes you then think, you know, you know, why do patients not respond to ERSA in PSC? Is it because they're men? Our, you know? our gender representative, our university would love this, so this gives more yeah. uh, reasons to do gender specific research. Well, uh, historically you've never stratified for gender in, in a number right. of treatment studies in, 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 the, in this field and you know, you can't assume that your patients are the same yeah. and maybe the, the, the gender in terms of response to UDCA is relevant. I think generally the, you know, the International PBC Study Group has been very successful and it's been able to use risk scores and then apply them into different populations. This and, is the and right it, key yeah. now. Now we come we to learn. risk scores yes. and prognosis. So we agree that there are responders, non-responders, and then in non-responders we need new drugs. We now have urbidicolic acid as uh, an approved drug in many parts of the world for ERSO non-responders. So there's now an interesting abstract uh, that I selected. It's the Late Breaker poster, 527, first author Maren Harms. And it's a collaboration between a large between the Erasmus University, Toronto, Southwestern Dallas, uh, the Barcelona Group, and uh, pharmaceutical industry in the set. And they looked at the large, large study, the POI study, which was the basis for approval of uh, this drug in non-responders. And uh, they use the Globe score. The Globe score is a score that identifies patients who have a normal life expectancy. So the idea is if you have a score less than 0.3, you have a life expectancy comparable to the normal population. And they looked retrospectively in this phase three trial, did these patients who were called responders achieve a Globe score less than 0.3? And overall, the message is yes if they responded, and much better than in the placebo group, they achieved this score less than 0.3. And they want prospectively to use this globe score now in the ongoing trial, the COBAL trial. Um, do you think the globe score, you are very experienced in PBC, uh, what are the pros and cons of the globe score? Uh, great, great question. So there's the globe score, there's the UK PBC score. I mean, the pros are that again, it makes it dynamic disease, that it captures risk and stage, and that's what's relevant to our patients who, want, who are high risk, who never want to become late stage. And it gives us associations between the combination of biochemistry and some hematology and outcome. The cons are we need to do these studies in a prospective way. And so we are at risk of using the same data and you know, essentially finding the same result because you know, we, make, we designed our clinical trials around cholinergic improvements in blood tests and the GLOBE score has a heavy bias towards improvements in, in alkaline phosphatase and therefore it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I think we need these studies to allow us to then embed them into the prospective follow-up of our patients. And there are other abstracts from the, the PBC study group looking at how you use the GLOBE score over time in patients. Because actually what's very interesting is you know, of course, patient, when a clinician uses the GLOBE score, they use the blood test in front of them. You know, we've, we've got patients who are newly diagnosed, but most of us have got many prevalent patients with PBC. Mm -hmm. And so you look at the blood test today, not uh, year one after UDCA. And we're learning that the GLOBE score continues to have predictive power, and scores like this will be informing us of risk and therefore utility of second line therapy. And it's hugely exciting that at, at, at EASL 2017, beyond this abstract that you chose, there's a late breaker from the, the, the French group looking at vesofibrate in PBC. And I think you've also saw a, a, an abstract that I was involved in about yes. you know, a therapy where instead of saying that we should accept our patients with PBC to just have reduced blood tests, we say, well, maybe it should be like autoimmune hepatitis. And in autoimmune hepatitis, you're not happy if the ALT is not normal, are you? Right, right. So bits, uh, uh, bits of fibrate is yeah. an easy drug because it's uh, off patent, yes. it's uh, uh, cheap, it's available. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, we, this afternoon there will be the late breaker presentation yes. and will be very promising and interesting. Uh, the study that you present is the Salad Delta. So this is a PPAR Delta. Uh, agonist. Could you elaborate a little bit on this drug? Yes, yeah, so this is in, this as is, you mentioned, yeah. it's impressive 
that you see normalization of alkaline phosphate. Yes, so this is early phase work, phase two studies. It's very hard to work in the PPAR area because of off-target effects and, and the, the, the concern about toxicity. But in this study, um, you see a universal response to this drug um, at, at doses of the, the, the saladalpa, where the majority of your patients are seeing nail normalization of the alkaline phosphates at 12 weeks. Now, this study was complicated by the fact that it was an early termination because there were changes in, in serum trans, trans, uh, amino transferase activity. That doesn't really necessarily mean hepatotoxicity. We know that fibrates put up your amino transferase activity, and we know that fibrates increase your creatinine. You know, this is why this area does have challenges, and, and likely why patients will ultimately prefer their drugs to be labeled rather than unlabeled because of the safety effects. But to have a drug that maybe will change the bar for our patients for the future from, you know, yes, they now use Ursa, then OCA, and you see a significant improvement in ALTFOS and Globe score. But to be telling our patients really in the future, in five years' time, you want a drug that's going to the cholangiocyte or the hepatocytes, having a very powerful effect on biliary transporters. And as a result, it's your alkaline phosphatase, your transaminases, which are improving and normal, and surrogates thereof, FGF19 and C4. Because I do think we should always step back. Okay. It's easy to measure sorry, by chemistry, but you want to see the biology as well, the okay. FGF19 and the C4. We're looking forward to see more results. Now, we, uh, in the last part, we discuss the more exciting diseases, you know, most exciting. And this is primary sclerosing cholagai, the black box of hepatology. And uh, we have uh, very interesting clinical uh, studies and presentations. And the one is uh, the study by Cyril and Poncien. It's a multi-center study, last authors, Lars Arbagen, from Oslo, several centers involved, and they compare in a multi-center randomized trial. It is general session 002, so this was in the opening general session, the second presentation, so it got a very prominent slot in, in front of thousands of, uh, of audience. Um, the study is prospective, straightforward. They compare the everyday practice now, stenting, and those with dominant structures with PSC, papillotomy, and stenting, and they compared it with balloon dilatation of dominant strictures without a papillotomy. And the overall message is that in the outcome there was no difference, so balloon dilatation was as good as stenting, but that there were less complications because uh, presumably due to papillotomy there were more uh, procedure associated complications and side effects. So the overall result is that presumably in the future balloon dilatation may be the future. So uh, I think it's interesting and may change our practice. Absolutely, but, but don't you think it's, I think you're right, and it's really exciting that there's a clinical trial in PSC, and you know, there was, there's also the, another clinical trial was presented, the oral presentation from the Gilead study of, of uh, anti lock cell 2 so you can do trials in PSC, I think that's important. You can do trials in AIH, you can do trials in PBC, and PSC now. Now, but tell me, Michael, the thing I find so interesting is when I think about ERCP in my practice in Birmingham, which is a high volume PSC program, we're transplanting 20 to 24 patients a year with PSC now in Birmingham, but we hardly use ERCP. So we have an amazing spread of ERCP practice across Europe. Yeah. So I'm wondering what you think from a center which does do ERCP, yeah. Yeah. how with technology moving, you know, and sometimes I think to myself, I must be wrong, I'm not doing ERCP. This is a stricturing disease. Okay. How do you, co how do you explain that? Yeah. First of all, it has been widely accepted in the field of endoscopy that practice matters and that the high volume centers have less complications, yes. number one. And in, that's important for patients. Number two, here we talk about a very complicated disease, primary sclerosing cholangitis, mm. and here expertise maybe count even more. So this is really something we have to discuss when we look at these data. Nevertheless. I think we have moved away from diagnostic ERCP to yes. therapeutic ERCP. I think it's general standard that MRCP has to be used first, and that we use ERCP only if there are dominant strictures yes. and we want to treat them. And, 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 that, and that's why there's a, a very similar study along that theme from uh, Rhinitatel, PS008, which shows that they could do ERCP and cirrhotic safely in a very high volume program run by Christoph Schramm and Ansgar Loza. You know, their ERC practice in cirrhotic patients, there was no greater risk. It still had risk though, let's, yeah. not be, let's not say there was no risk. Now, what was interesting about that study, there wasn't clear benefit, but that wasn't the purpose of the study. So I think you're absolutely right. You're talking about 
the, why ILC 2070 is, is such an exciting meeting because we've been able to talk about science, new drugs, but clinical practice. Yeah. Uh, you already mentioned the Simtuzumab study, and I think we have to mention this. It's a negative study, but we have to praise the industry and push them to yes. publish even negative data, and there's a large prospective cohort, there's a lot of information. Absolutely to get amazing and you know, how great to see that in PSC we have a study that looks like a hep C study or a NASH study with two years of drug, uh, biopsies, uh, there's a genomic study presented from it at, at this uh, meeting, there's Cynthia Levy's work and I was a co-author, the last author on that paper around ELF-FOS from that study and there's studies coming out from Chris Bolas from the, that data set about ELF in PSE. So we're learning so much and I think that, that it, it speaks to the fact that our patients can take part in okay. difficult studies. Now uh, I come to a presentation where you again have a conflict of interest. The first author is Trivedi. It's uh, uh, the poster session 007. It's called Ilio Anal Pouch Anastomosis Negatively Impact Craft Survival Following Liver Transplantation for Primary Sclerosis in Conangitis. First author is Palak Trivedi. I try to summarize it in my words. You are a very high volume PSC transplanting center. You mentioned this. Um, for me, it's a little bit surprising that il il and ileostomy should be superior to anal pouch procedure. Can you elaborate on this? I, I think it is interesting, but I think it speaks to the importance of inflammation. And I think we're going to talk about that later on, actually. You know, pouchitis is active. Maybe it's driven by the microbiome, but it's doing something in terms of inflammation. And what we actually saw, which was very interesting in the study, that it seemed to be graft loss associated with having pouchitis, that all the patients who had a pouch had, pou had problems with their pouch after liver transplantation. And interestingly, there's an association with hepatic artery thrombosis. That I found so, interesting. So we know that our IBD patients are prothrombotic. Yeah. We know that our PSC patients have, at least in our experience, a 10% rate of hepatic artery yeah. thrombosis when it should be much lower yeah. for the rest of the population. So well, PS, PSC, yeah. in a general transplantation, PSC is a very sticky disease. Isn't yeah, it? but I mean, they, I mean, they lose their colon, these patients, and yes. then have a liver transplant. Uh, I think this is a little bit too much. Uh, the question is, if I would be a patient, I would prefer uh, a pouch in contrast to ileostomy. Absolutely. Uh, the question is whether we could prevent this arterial thrombosis. Yes, by another method, by yes. uh, aspirin, enoxaparin, and anticoagulation. Uh, no uh, uh, I agree totally, and I think that that is our biggest dilemma in this whole a area. We've, we've had this discussion about does having your colon put, um, mean that you get more recurrence? Now we've got data that pouchitis means you're more likely to lose the graft. But in the real world, these are young people, yeah. and it's a choice between a stoma and a pouch. Yeah. But the pouch experience of our patients with PSC is not good. And, and it's a one center. Yes. Uh, certainly the leading center. But it's but a problem yeah. to be one center. There's always a risk of bias. Yeah. Very good. So I think now in the last two minutes we have left, we come to a very exciting disease, which only large tertiary referral center C, and this is secondary sclerosis and cholangitis in the critically ill patient. SSC slash CIP. What does it mean? I try to introduce this for those not familiar with us. We became aware of the last five to ten years of this disorder. These are patients who underwent weeks and months long intensive care medicine following lung transplantation, heart transplantation, bone marrow transplantation, stem cell transplantation. They have a chronic intensive care uh, treatment, uh, they have infections, and they see a progressive destruction of the bile ducts, which seems to be a mixture of ischemia, of casting, of infections. Uh, there seems to be a paralysis of the transporters of the biliary canaliculum. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we have many questions concerning the pathogenesis. And uh, before we design therapies, and uh, sometimes only transplantation is the, the solution, in patients who already had lung transplantation, who already underwent bone marrow transplantation, so very difficult. And we have uh, international groups, and I want to highlight the group in Graz um, uh, by uh, Peter Fickert and the group in Homburg uh, by Frank Lammert, and they looked at uh, uh, gut microbiota, uh, gut permeability and dysbiosis, and the overall Result is that they find a dysbiosis of the gut microbiota associated with an increased gut permeability. Uh, this makes sense. This could have been predicted. 
And before we get in the discussion, Gideon, I want to mention a second um, abstract, and this is the abstract from Friday, 381, and this looked at genetic predisposition. And on the one side, we have dysbiosis, we have the increased permeability. On the other side, not everybody with intensive care develops a, a SSC. So there may be a genetic predisposition, and therefore uh, uh, they looked, these groups looked at various genetic markers, and the one that popped up is NOD2 mutations. So they see a polymorphism, uh, a genetic variant of a a NOD2, which is prone to bacterial infections, mm -hmm. which has been identified as a major genetic risk factor in Crohn's disease, and this is now a genetic factor for developing secondary sclerosing cholangitis. Is that a breakthrough, Gideon? I think it's very interesting and I think you know you talked about PAC as being the black box of hepatology and so to solve that black box we want to look at the boxes outside where the, the, the light is shone and the box is open. So learning about secondary sclerosis and cholangitis in these very defined settings such as critical care patients or IgG4 disease is allowing us to identify pathways to, to injury. And so what you've described in those two very interesting abstracts is one the microbiome, and that immediately comes back to our discussion about pouchitis and, and what, how, what, how does a little bit of a pouchitis cause a problem after a liver transplant, and you know, you're showing in secondary sclerosis and cholangitis that changes in the microbiome are maybe functionally relevant and may be relevant to why you then get biliary disease. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as an aside, there's, a, there's an, uh, an oral presentation saying that the bile is not sterile. There are bugs in, in biles. People are now doing, you know, microbiome analysis of bile samples. And then the genetics starts to get very interesting. Now, we haven't learned a huge amount from genetics at PSE, let's be honest. We've learned more about HLA, but we knew that already. And we've learned lots of signals, but none of them give a story. But by targeting our genetic studies into very specific phenotypes, secondary sclerosis and cholangitis, and looking then at very specific genes, you may be able to dissect all that noise and start to see individual pathways. And there's a coalescence of messages here, isn't there? There's, there's something about how do you sense inflammation and where does that inflammation come from? And the bugs that we live with, and as I think we both know, our patients who are long-term patients on intensive care have got significant changes in their microbiome. There's been a lot of use of antibiotics, changes in nutrition, um, changes in their bowel function, you know, and it's, it's driving the complications that are real to them and then come to your liver clinic later Thank on. You. Thank you. So, dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Gideon Hirschfeld from Birmingham, UK, myself from Hanover, Germany. We had the privilege to select abstracts. Selection always means there is a bias. This is subjective selection. We apologize for any abstract in the field that we did not discuss in detail. We've discussed autoimmune hepatitis and we have found that we have new therapies coming up and we need new therapies. We discussed the biologicals and the future hope. We looked into PBC, which raised a lot of interest. There are new drugs coming up. Uh, either uh, old kids on the block like Besa Fibrate or new kids on the block like uh, PIPA Delta agonists. And we have the interesting field of PSC developing with very important clinical trials like the comparison of stenting and balloon dilatation. We have seen new drugs. We learned there can be trials in PSC despite the fact that we're still struggling for the ideal endpoint. And then we have seen a very interesting disease, secondary sclerosing cholangitis, a very severe disease, uh, life-threatening for the patient, where we now see insights into the pathogenesis and the genetic background. This is all you can see on the liver tree of easel and hope you enjoy our conversation and you've got an appetite to look at the other presentations who highlight presentations from this International Liver Congress, easel 2017 in Amsterdam. Thank you very much. Thank you.